Hello everyone, welcome to a new episode of Pada Spotlight. Um, I would say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are based at the moment. I hope you are all safe and well, given the current circumstances. Um, my name is Rung Tep Geo. I am with the Pada membership team. And today we are hosting a Pada Spotlight together with Elite Heavens. Um, our speaker is going to be John Stonham, the CEO of Elite Heavens. And the topic of today's webinar is uh, COVID-19 crisis management and impact on the luxury hospitality industry, case study by Elite Heavens. That was a long title, but we are very excited um, to be hearing this presentation. And um, before we jump into it, let me just have a few, like give you a bit of information about PADA and um, about how this webinar is gonna um, move forward. Uh, so most of you are probably familiar with PADA. We are a membership organization. Um, we have been around since 1951. We do all kinds of different things, events, um, networking, um, publications, and since last year, we have this PADA Spotlight webinar in our repertoire. So this is something that we offer members, where members can share their expertise. Um, you can also find all the recordings on our YouTube channel, uh, including this one, um, once it's been um, published. For this um, webinar, if you have any questions, please put, submit the questions in the Q&A box. There is a little Q&A box I think at the bottom of your page um, for this webinar. So Mr. John Stoneham is um, happy to answer any questions at the end of the webinar. So please um, submit whatever you want to know. And then um, in the chat box, uh, in the chat function itself, you can just like have a little chat with the people, but the questions, please submit them in the Q&A box. Um, I think that is it for like how we will proceed with this webinar. And now um, I'm excited to hear more about how Elite Heavens has kind of like faced the situation that we're in right now. Um, yes, how prepared they were, what have they been, like what have they been doing so far? But yeah, I will hand the words over to Mr. John Stoneham, CEO of Elite Heavens. Welcome, John. Thanks, Ron. Thanks very much. Um, I'm just going to share my screen now. Perhaps you can confirm you can see that okay? Everything looks great. Yes. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, um, hello everybody, um, and thank you for attending today. Um, as I said, my name is John Stonham. Uh, I'm the CEO of Elite Havens, and I'm sitting here in Singapore. Um, I have been sitting here in Singapore since February. Um, for those of you who know me well, you know, I spend 70% of my time traveling, so that's a very uh, unusual experience for me. Um, I'm gonna talk about Elite Havens and how we've handled COVID so far. Um, and sort of our outlook for the future uh, and, 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 and how, how, how we think it's going to, things are going to go forward. Um, I think perhaps to start with, I'll give a little bit of background to Elite Havens because um, I think it'll help explain the sort of context uh, of some of the challenges we face as a company and, and how we're dealing with them. Um, we were established in uh, 1998. So we're 22 years old, so we're not a young company. Um, as a result, I guess we've experienced quite a few events over the years. Um, and personally, I've been in the travel industry for 27 years. Uh, and I guess there's a rule of thumb which says that every seven years we seem to have a major crisis. Um, but every year in between, we seem to have some minor ones as well. COVID obviously has proven more significant uh, in the fact that it's had a global reach um, and it seems to want to stick around for a lot longer than most of the challenges we've faced over the years. We're a, a, a 
curated collection of 300 odd uh, luxury villas. Um, we manage and effectively market people's second homes. Um, these are individual homes with individual owners. So decisions we make are on behalf of a sort of very diverse group of individuals. Um, sometimes that has its challenges. Um, very different from a hotel where you'll have one owner and many keys. We have many keys with many owners. Um, the, in, within our villas, uh, we have over 2000 staff uh, looking after the villas. Um, and I guess service standard really defines what an elite haven is. The emphasis for us is very much luxury and service, building a relationship, I guess, between the staff and the guest so that people walk away having had a memorable experience. Um, we're a high touch company, which in the current climate of a no touch world um, is quite a challenge. But I think really you should look at our homes as really single key private hotels um, with a full set of staff. So our villas come with managers, chefs, butlers. Um, and the COVID situation, I guess, is as much concern for our staff as it is for our guests. Um, and so we have a balancing act between those. Typically, we look after about 80,000 guests a year. Um, they come from about 100 countries and we do about $40 million worth of bookings per year. 50% um, of our business comes direct and 50% of our business comes from travel agents and third parties. Um, and, but we do very little actually with OTAs. Uh, so that gives you a bit of background there. Our guests book typically four to six months ahead um, of check-in. So when COVID hit, we had a significant number and value of bookings on our books. Um, and at the same time, we have a very strict cancellation policy because the opportunity of a canceled booking, the opportunity cost is very high. If we lose a booking, the owner typically loses 100% of the revenue. So therefore the cancellation policies are quite strict. Um, we are the market leader in the region. Um, and as of 2018, uh, we're part of the Dusit Hospitality Group. If I look at where the villas are, um, clearly Thailand with Phuket and Koh Samui uh, and Indonesia in Bali and Lombok uh, are our largest markets, followed by Japan, uh, Sri Lanka and Maldives to the lesser extent. Um, and we've recently opened up in India, um, principally in Goa, uh, with a local partner. Now, in most cases, we're responsible for the upkeep of these properties, as well as the exclusive global marketing of them worldwide. So we're responsible for the maintenance, we're responsible for the guest services, and we're responsible for the occupancy. I think the first thing to notice about pretty much all of our markets here, except for maybe India, is they rely on international travel. Um, and currently, all of these markets have closed borders, except for the Maldives, which has uh, reopened. So our market, who is our market? Um, we predominantly host families. 85% of our business comes from families, whether it's a single family or multiple families or multi-generational. Uh, it's the, by far the largest chunk of our business. And the rest of it is made up of groups. Typically, people will come to us for a family vacation, but many will come to celebrate significant events, whether it's a birthday or a wedding or an anniversary. So we're typically holding something like four to 500 weddings a year. And a, and a villa is presenting an opportunity for a group to meet in a sort of very private environment in a cost-effective manner, but also with a very personal experience. Um, but as many of you will know, Families as a travel group are not high risk takers. So we're in a market which relies on international travel. And the bulk of our business comes from a group which aren't high risk takers. In terms of our source markets, um, 
these are our top markets. And as you can see, we have some red flags straight away. Let's look at Australia. Australia's clearly closed its borders. Um, it's suggesting that it won't be open for international travel until Q2 2021. It represents 30% of our market. At the other end of the extreme, you have something like China, which represents 14% of our market. It was considered the starting point of COVID, I guess, um, but it's looking potentially to be one of the first markets which in, opens up again for international foreign travel. It's already, it's domestic travel is already uh, thriving and back in full swing, um, and it's pushing hard to go back and do, do overseas travel. ASEAN Hong Kong represents 28% of our business. Um, predominantly Singapore and Hong Kong are the key markets here. And again, both of those have got tightly closed borders. Then we've got Europe at 15%. Um, Europe seems to be king of the second wave at the moment, with Spain, Portugal, France, Germany, all experiencing uh, uptakes or second uptakes uh, and concerns there. And then North America makes up 5%, of which the bulk of that is America. I think America is probably best described as a complete basket case. Um, and then the other rest of the world, the 8% really is made up of sort of uh, the Middle East uh, and Africa. So it doesn't look the prettiest of pictures. Virtually all of our markets um, are, uh, are, have issues. Um, we're international. We rely on families, which are not the greatest uh, uh, risk takers. We have very little domestic market. Um, so that gives a background of who we are, what we have, and, and who visits us. Um, so how's our business being impacted? Um, I've got a slide here which shows the booking inquiries we've done over the last three years by month. Um, blue represents 2018, red 2019, and green 2020. You can see we had a very strong January this year, um, and then it just capitulates down to a low point in April and May. Um, we've had small signs of recoveries in terms of more bookings in June, July, and August. Um, and so that's encouraging, but we're currently having inquiries at 20% of what we would expect at this time of year. And if you look at say our August bookings, um, you would find that uh, most of those bookings are for August. Um, people are not confident about booking in the future at the moment. So um, we're seeing a real change in how people book. Typically, we expect people to book four to six months in advance. Nowadays, we're finding people are booking for the following week. I'll show slide, the next slide really talks about our check-ins. So these are people who are checking in in a particular month. And again, blue is 2018, red 2019, and green 2020. You can see that we had an absolutely stellar, stellar January. And I think there's a lot of people in the travel industry who thought that 2020 was going to be their year. Um, and uh, I know that at the beginning of the year, Elite Havens was very confident this was going to be a good year. We had really good forward bookings and our January just was so strong. Um, so it was very encouraging. We were going back to something like 2017. That was the last time we had levels like this. But after January, you can see it absolutely drops off, uh, drops off very quickly. Uh, and then you get down to April through to November. Really, the check-ins happening at this stage are very minimal. Um, you'll see signs of life again in December, uh, where there's a sense of optimism that some people think they might be able to return. Um, I've also added in, uh, in yellow the 2021 bookings that we have in place. Um, and you'll see that, again, we've got a good foundation for next year, um, but really confidence starts to hit in about April. Uh, period Easter next year, where we start to see some more guest confidence. Um, 
but our rental revenues at the moment are running around about 15% of what we would normally expect. So we make money from two, two sides of the equation. We make money from managing the villas and we take a management fee and we make money from the rentals uh, amounts. Um, our management side of the business has re remained relatively stable mainly because we're actually working very hard for the owners at the moment in terms of minimizing their costs uh, and operating their villas. And a lot of owners have used the time where they've had downtime to actually do maintenance. Uh, so that side of the business has stayed stable. The rental side of the business has absolutely capitulated. Um, so we have this reliance on international guests. We have this reliance on families. And 2020, you can see, has been severely impacted by, by the business has been impacted. Um, I don't think we're any different from any hotels or any attractions who rely on the same markets. I've seen pretty much the same story everywhere I look in Asia. Um, Bali recently announced that its average hotel occupancy was 1%. Um, Phuket hotels, um, many of them have stayed closed because they don't see the economics of actually opening. So I think the story that we're experiencing is no different from pretty much everybody in the industry. One of the questions we posed was, were we ready for COVID? Um, I'm gonna put a slide up here of some of the major events which have happened over the last 20 years. They're wide and range, the different ranges and, and, and what's surprising to me is how frequent we have events. Um, they vary dramatically in their geographical impact. They vary dramatically in their scale. You know, in 2002, we had the Bali bombing, which severely affected business in Bali. Um, 2002, running into 2003, we had SARS. Um, now, I lived in Hong Kong at the time, um, it was really quite a scary time. Um, but after four or five months, it all but disappeared. Um, so its impact was uh, very different. So looking at all of these events, you say, well, were we prepared? Well, the answer was yes and no. Um, we had recently dealt with um, the Lombok earthquake, um, which damaged a lot of product in Lombok, but also damaged a lot of staff, homes, etc. Uh, had a dramatic impact. Um, uh, so we've already had that. We'd already dealt with some uh, volcanoes in Bali, uh, closing down airports for extended periods of time, both in 2018 and in 2019. And then we've just dealt re more recently with the bombing in Sri Lanka uh, over Easter. So yes, we were prepared for disruptive events. We have processes in place, we have communication templates, um, and we had done this before, so we knew how to handle these types of events. But no, we were not prepared for one of the scale or longevity that COVID-19 has presented. Here we are six months in, and we're still unsure how things are gonna turn out. We don't know what the new normal looks like, what seems pretty certain is 2020 seems very much a write-off. So how are we coping with COVID? And what strategies have we adopted to sort of uh, deal with it? I've broken COVID up into sort of five stages at the moment, and that may change as time goes on. Um, but each of these stages has required us to rethink what our strategy was, how we run the business, and who our target markets were. Um, so I would say that the whole, um, these phases have been quite brutal on the business. Um, but what amazes me is the sort of resilience and adaptability of the Elite Havens team in terms of just picking up and just going back at it enthusiastically. So if we look at these five stages, the first stage of the early days, very much perceived as a China problem. Second phase, we started to have selective lockdown and also lockouts and travel started to slow. Um, 
the third phase really we did have we've, 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 we got to a global shutdown where all travel stopped and I don't think anyone uh, in the industry around now has ever experienced that and now we're looking at sort of tentative reopening there's talk of travel bubbles and corridors um, travel corridors and but against that we have second waves which are pushing enthusiasm for reopening back um, and I guess the final stage will be the new normal, whatever the new normal looks like. And I'm guessing at the moment, we're somewhere between stage three and four. Um, and if we look at how we handled each of those stages in detail, the early days, very much a China problem. Very localized, stemming from China. Many of our management team had been around when SARS were around. So yes, we thought it was gonna be intense, but we thought after a few months, it would be gone. Um, it would remain relatively localized and business would bounce back with a vengeance. Um, the, the bounce back after SARS was phenomenal. And so the only experience we had was something like SARS. And if you cast your mind back to this period, you know, people started quarantining uh, Chinese travelers, people who traveled to China, um, then we were leading up to flight uh, cancellations. Um, and our biggest problem actually was stranded Chinese guests. Um, this all happened around Chinese New Year when we happened to be busiest with mainland Chinese and Hong Kong guests. Uh, and suddenly we had a bunch of guests who either couldn't go home uh, or in some cases didn't want to go home. Uh, for understandable reasons. Um, and on the other side of that, we just had guests who just didn't show up because their flights were canceled. Um, so this very short period around the end of January, middle of, uh, beginning of February, um, you know, we felt this was very much a, a local problem. So our marketing really didn't change. Um, our marketing communication message focused on reassurance for our future guests. Um, we might have done a slight change in emphasis, you know, the, the, the villa offers you a luxury of space, a luxury of privacy and a luxury of personalization. We added in there, it has the safety of space. You know, you're, you've got your own social distancing, you know, you're not going to be mixing with people who, who've been to China. So therefore come and stay in the villa and know who you're mixing with. Um, so really, we saw this as a very small problem to start with. Um, and, um, you know, uh, we were marketing to our normal destinations, our villas were safe, um, and really our forward bookings were barely affected. In February, our bookings were down about 12%, and that could almost completely be explained by the China market drying up. So really the only issues we had to face are stranded guests and reassuring future guests that business was as usual. We were wrong. Clearly, we were very, very wrong. And I guess this was the first of many times we were wrong over this process. Phase two became a sort of selective lockdown. February started as a sort of gradual lockdown, in some cases lockout. So if you take Singapore, for example, they started to refuse travelers from Korea, Italy, Iran, and then Spain and Germany got crossed off. I guess no one was really clear how to handle and how serious this was, and, and, and as, as included. Um, and really in late February, our message to our clients was, you know, come, just don't come now, come a little later in the year, because like SARS, this will be over in May, um, and we'll be back to business as normal. So we introduced new booking terms um, so that people could book with confidence. Clearly customers were becoming much more concerned and sensitive about booking and the fact that they wanted to make sure they could get their money back if they were affected. Um, so we really had a two pronged attack at this stage, which was yes, come and stay with us. And yes, if you are affected by COVID, we'll give you a full refund and we'll park our, our, ter our normal terms and conditions. But at the same time, the villa is a very safe environment to stay in versus a hotel. Uh, and, and COVID, we've adopted serious COVID standards within the villa. Uh, and our operational team had gone out and done a thorough exercise in training staff and cleaning villas, offering hygiene, uh, hygiene cleaning, giving them a uh, PPE equipment, 
training on guest interaction to make sure that our experiences with the, with the guests were, were, were suitable. And, and those messages were pumped out onto our, uh, on, onto our marketing channels. But as we moved into March, I think it became increasingly obvious that the short-term bookings weren't going to happen. So our marketing was very much focused on July high season um, and Christmas, which is by far the best, uh, the biggest period for us, or even 2021. So there's a real emphasis at this stage on sort of plan ahead, book now, take early bird, you know, so we had early bird messages out for July and August, which was what we thought would be the post virus situation. Um, and, you know, much is made at the time that the summer would come and the virus would disappear, much the same as it had with SARS, there'd be a recovery and everything would be very similar to 2003. So we were targeting all our traditional markets and our social media messages were very much aimed at COVID and cleanliness, etc. Again, we were wrong. We were very, very wrong. Um, and whilst we booked significant numbers in February, um, the market fell away very, very quickly. Uh, and by the third week of March, most of our source markets and most of our destination markets were absolutely in complete lockdown. Indonesia was closed, Thailand was closed, Singapore was closed, Australia was closed, New Zealand was closed. All of our markets, both destination uh, and, and source markets, had closed their doors. So really now we're in a, in a, in a very different scenario. Um, we have little revenue. Um, so the whole emphasis of the business now changes to look at our costs, look at our owner's costs, and to preserving cash. Um, a different emphasis on the business and marketing was really scaling back. At the same time in February, we wavered all of our cancellation policies uh, and gave credit for bookings. Um, at the time, we were giving credit for six months because, again, our mindset was this is going to be over by July. Um, now, those credits were extended to 2021. We had a significant number of bookings on our books, um, and they were now beginning to, 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 to be postponed. Um, and guests were happy to postpone them um, so they could keep their deposits. Um, we were now working with insurance companies so, com uh, so guests could do claims uh, against their bookings. And we had a sort of rolling program of working three months ahead because, again, our mindset was this will be over in three months and then we don't need to disturb the guests four months out because it'll be okay then. Um, now, all of these procedures and plans we had before because we'd used them before. Um, we knew that if we were proactive with guests and reached out to them, it gave us goodwill. Um, of course, there were exceptions. But now we have the added uh, issue that we have to deal with our owners. Uh, it's clear we're gonna have significant holes in their budgets. Uh, and also we're having to look at how their operating costs. So at this stage, we still had this mindset that the end of the year would happen. Global lockdown, I guess, started end of March. Um, and what then our thought process was, was, well, this global lockdown is only going to last a few, uh, 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 a few weeks, maybe a month or so, but clearly it wasn't. And it went from one month to two months to many months. Um, so we had full global lockdown, both on international markets. We had global lockdown for domestic travel in almost all markets. And now we get to the stage where Airports, hotels, and airlines are starting to be mothballed. Uh, places are closing down. There is no leisure market. There is no business market. Um, travel as we knew it had totally stopped. So with no leisure customers, customers and no families um, and little domestic travel, the only option for us was to offer the villas to long-stay guests. Um, these are guests who are either stranded or elected not to go home. And we were doing this at very creative prices. And, and surprisingly, we did secure quite good bookings, you know, 30 nights, uh, some people booking multiple, multiple months, uh, predominantly Chinese and Russians, who for some reason didn't seem in a hurry to return home. But at the same time, the whole marketing message turned as well. Um, 
there's a strong undercurrent coming out about responsible travel. Social media posts which encourage travel started getting meeting a barrage of sort of brand negativity. And so we had to start looking at what messages we put out there. Um, and our marketing messages, while we're targeting long stay guests and maybe some staycations or location, local, local residents who could possibly travel, the marketing messages change focus completely towards social responsibility uh, and things that we were doing for the community to get help get the community through this. And obviously marketing spend changed dramatically at the same time. So I think at this time, many travel companies moved from talking about COVID safety standards to a clear message, which was stay at home. So travel companies were now promoting don't travel, which for me is a first. Um, and, 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 you know, it comes as a real shock when you, you're actually encouraging people not to come and stay with you. But, uh, so really the whole focus of our company at this stage, Lee Havens was looking at costs. Um, how can we survive this? So with no travel, this, the, the whole emphasis come, comes now down to survival. Um, cost saving, looking at how we handle staff, both within the villas and how we handle staff um, within elite havens as well. And at the same time, as the days tick by, we keep reaching out to guests to say, okay, we need to postpone your booking um, because it doesn't look like you'll be able to come. And I don't think we were the only ones to misjudge quite the longevity of this, uh, of how long COVID was last. If you start looking at the timing and the messages which came out with some of the uh, larger companies, um, it was around this time that suddenly people dawned on them that actually travel is not going to be the scale that we saw before. So Marriott were the first to come out with sort of layoffs, but that was back in March. Um, but the word there was very much temporary. This is a temporary layoff because primarily what's happening in China. As you get into April, May, those messages became much more permanent with job cuts. Airbnb cutting 25% of its workforce. Uh, just recently in August, Booking.com cutting 25% of its workforce. People are now looking at saying we are having smaller companies, but quite late in the day, it was quite late on after the introduction, uh, after, after COVID started, that people started to realize this. Um, because most people's experiences of things like SARS was it didn't go on for that long. So the fourth phase, the sort of phase we're just entering into, I guess, is this tentative reopening. Now, I can say that at Elite Havens, we got our forecasting wrong at every stage. In February, we thought it would be over by May. In March, we thought we'd have a summer season. In July, we were hopeful for Christmas. And I don't think we were alone in that. And so now people are trying to predict when we're going to reopen. Um, and that, I think, is extremely difficult to do. We're now in September. Um, we don't have a sort of a confident solution yet, um, although I know a lot of people are trying. The Thai government are trying extremely hard to open up. Um, the Australian government are making no attempts at all. Um, Indonesia has pushed back until the end of the year. Um, so there's different, different organizations trying different things. Um, we've certainly not been helped by governments. Um, but then again, I don't envy the position they're in. It's very difficult to actually make these decisions. Um, the last one I enjoyed recently, uh, very recently actually, was the Safe and Sealed campaign, which came out for Thailand. Um, it announced it was gonna start on October the 1st, and the cutting that I was reading said it required you had to use Thai Airways. Um, two days later, Thai Airways announced that they'll start flights on November the 1st. Um, so these communication disconnects were not uncommon as people were striving to see how they could reopen and, our, and the fluid reopening dates, um, you know, keep getting pushed back, keep getting pushed back. So we're in this very tentative reopening phase. Um, and the messages coming out have been very mixed as people try and juggle economies with health, 
business survival with protecting local communities. I think what we're clear of in Elite Havens is that the only market out there at the moment is the domestic or the local residential market and will be sort of certainly for the next six months. So all of our marketing effort is very much focused on expats and local residents um, staying with us in the absence of any international traveler. So campaigns we're putting out now are sort of, okay, we used to work from home. Why not work from home, not in Bangkok, but work from home on a nice beach setting in Koh Samui. Get out the city and have a different choice, to, a, a different, a different uh, sort of uh, position. Um, and same with, uh, with, with families, you know, instead of um, uh, having a family holiday in a hotel, come and have natural social distancing in a villa uh, and, ha and, 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 and be secure that you know where everyone has been who you're staying with. Still, we're doing a little bit of marketing towards this dream for uh, next year. You know, dream now, travel later, come visit us in 2021. But very clearly, we're seeing a real reticence to book at the moment until people see a much more solid environment. And for us, the domestic market has never been our market. Uh, we've always relied on international travelers um, and we've never really focused on it. So we don't have much experience in this area. So it's been an interesting exercise learning. Um, and of course, budgets are much more limited. Um, so we've made strong use of play like local influencers. Um, I think we have one group coming to stay with us on Monday, which has a staggering following of 28 million people. Um, I, absolutely um, incredible. Um, so active use of social media groups, using local language. Uh, and in case of Thailand, we're leveraging Dusit, um, who are our parent company, because they have a strong um, following, obviously, in, 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 the, in the Thai market. Um, we've dialed, dialed, back our, dialed back our international marketing, dialed back our uh, sort of AdWords, dialed back uh, these aspects and focused very much on the local markets. What we're clear on is that the opening is going to be slow uh, and probably later than we think. Um, we've got this conflict between second waves and travel bubbles. Uh, and governments not actually being fairly very cohesive. So we think this is going to take a little longer than people think. And therefore, we're still of this mentality that we have to be in a cost-saving um, sort of uh, mode for, for, the t for the time being. So I guess the next stage then is what the new normal looks like after we start to opening. Because the way we see this happening is we do see that there will be small pockets of business opening. Um, and then as people get more confident, then that, that, that will open further. So what is the new normal? Well, I guess we don't really know what the new normal looks like, but we have a good idea of what the recipe is to return for people to return to leisure travel. And really it's only one aspect which we're interested in. And that's clients need to be confident. Um, they need to be confident that there's a reliable airline and a reliable airline schedule. They need to be confident that they're not gonna be quarantining on the way in or quarantining on the way out. They need to be confident that tests are simple and quick and apps are easy to use. So really confidence, client confidence is the only thing which is gonna bring back travel. They don't want to be going to accommodation and, and meeting staff who are PPD'd up to the, you know, with plastic screens and, and, and rubber gloves. And uh, uh, so these are not the sorts of things that clients who are in leisure travel want to see. What they want to see uh, is a relaxing and simple process. Um, and maybe a vaccine is the only, only solution. Or we just see that these uh, um, these bubbles open up slowly, it builds confidence, and then, the, then that will uh, build on, and confidence will then build on that. Um, what we do know is there is a huge pent up demand. Um, and I do feel that once that confidence does come back, 
then we will see a much a very strong return. I think the only question mark for us is how much damage has been done to the economy and people's disposable income to see whether they are able to actually afford to do that leisure travel uh, in the same manner that they were before. So we don't know what the new normal looks like, but basic uh, knowledge of customers realize that we need something which is simple uh, and effective so that people can enjoy their holiday and, and uh, it's not a hassle, I guess. So what have we learned from COVID? Um, I think the first thing is you're gonna get a lot, we, we got a lot wrong. Um, so in fact, we were pretty much wrong in all our forecasting at all stages. Um, so therefore we've had to be agile and we've had to be flexible um, as a result of that. And some of these sort of periods only lasted a few weeks and suddenly we were changing tack again. Um, so very much sort of, there are lessons to be learned. Um, learn, move on, but be agile, be flexible. Um, the other thing we've learned is that to communicate and communicate early. And that's with all of the stakeholders. Um, obviously, the obvious one is the guests, um, but also the owners um, and our staff. Uh, and, and our shareholders. So we've had to make sure we communicate regularly and clearly uh, as we learn more information um, and as, as time keeps, uh, as we become more knowledgeable. Um, I've also learned there are times not to promote travel. And social media uh, can be quite um, unforgiving uh, in that manner. Um, and we've also learned that sometimes it doesn't matter what the price is, there is no market. Um, so those are some of the things we've learned. Um, but out of, out of this comes opportunities and at Elite Havens, I mean, just recently, um, we're seeing villas come to us um, who are looking for uh, management companies which are strong and are gonna be around in five years time. Um, we signed a complex up last week um, and we have another one which is we're talking to. So this is encouraging. Um, you know, we, we feel that this will create market opportunities. Um, but it's true that COVID, you know, things like this has happened before. Um, it will happen again, but travel is a constant. And we will travel, people love traveling and it won't stop, especially in the leisure market. Um, but, um, one of the things we found very important is making sure you adhere to your brand values. You know, our brand values stand around service. Um, we desperately try to communicate with our clients, making sure we're giving them the very best service, even though they can't come to us. Um, it's very important that they still understand us as a luxury product. And they understand that we give the very best service. Um, and I guess the last thing is that life is a journey. We will have these things thrown at us. Um, and it's continuous. So the future of travel, um, I have to say, I think alternative accommodation has benefited from this and will benefit. Um, we've seen many, many more people try alternative accommodation as, as an alternative to hotels. Um, you know, if you look at the States, the people who are doing staycations within 30 miles of where they live, um, these are people who who haven't really experienced an alternative accommodation like a villa or a gîte in France, uh, a chalet in the Alps, etc. And now they're trying them because they want an alternative. So I think Elite Havens and the industry will certainly benefit from the fact that we've had much broader usage over the last six months. Recently, I've just tried a book somewhere in the UK and there's almost nothing available um, for, for um, uh, in terms of an Airbnb type product. Other, other, thing, other pressures on the future travel, um, sustainability and global warming, they are absolutely coming. Um, and in Europe, you're certainly seeing flight shaming now, uh, where people um, are, are very conscious about how much time they spend on airplanes. So the message we're seeing now is very much travel less. Um, and if we're traveling less, then we need to stay longer uh, and experience more and experience more, very much more about experiencing the community you're in um, or experiencing it with people you know and love. And so we're, we, we 
would see that as a core message going forward. Uh, and again, which would benefit the type of product that we offer. Um, work from home, I think, has changed the dynamic as well. Um, people clearly now are comfortable with working from home, the technology, etc. cetera. Um, the question is, does it have to be your home? Um, you know, all of our villas have, uh, you know, Wi-Fi and strong um, uh, places that people could work. Um, and so what we've seen over the last four or five months is people have quite enjoyed working in the villas and bringing the family down um, during the school holidays, but staying down there instead of for a two week holiday, staying down there for four weeks or six weeks, um, but disappearing off to do some work during the day. I think the other thing which has changed dramatically is business travel. Um, I think with that the technology has proven to businesses that things will change, have changed, and the way we do business, the way we travel, the amount we travel will change. I think leisure has been less impacted, and I think sort of the leisure travel that Elite Havens experiences will see will see less going forward. Um, and the only other thing I would say is that I do think the rebound will be quicker and stronger once it starts than we think. I think a lot of people think this is going to be a slow and painful, painful journey return. I don't think so. I think once we hit a tipping point of confidence, um, then we will have uh, a very significant um, and quick return to what we expect is normal uh, or close to normal. Um, so thank you very much. I hope that's given you some insights about how Elite Havens has coped with the last six months. No doubt the journey over the next six months is going to be as interesting. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, John. That was um, a very interesting, insightful presentation. I read some of the messages in the chat and some of the participants also said very useful and informative. Um, please feel free to send your questions in the Q&A box. Um, John is happy to answer some now. So we got one here, John. I'll read this one out. Um, it says, what would you suggest uh, luxury hotels to do in order to stay alive until travelers come back? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, that's a very interesting one. It's a cost issue. If you can't deal with the revenue issue, then you have a cost issue. Um, the simple equation of a PL. Um, so we've had to very much focus on cost issues over the last few months, and most hotels have to do that. Uh, there is a market out there, you know, in, in some places. I mean, for example, in India, um, the villas are thriving um, because the local market is getting out of Mumbai and Delhi uh, and um, um, and, and really, and so, so the villas there are having the biggest sort of boost they've had. And same with Australia. Um, so it's a matter of actually looking for which markets are relevant at this stage um, and, and seeing if, they, if they're, they're suitable for you. Um, otherwise, it's just survival, I'm afraid. Uh, and that's why we're seeing a lot of the hotels aren't reopening at this stage because they see that the economics don't make sense at this stage. Okay, thank you. Um, that was the, the one question that we've received so far. Uh, we also, um, some people ask if they can get the presentation uh, that you just showed. Um, the presentation will be available to PADA members after yeah. uh, when we send out the recording. So you will receive that if you're a PADA member. Um, and yes. Is there any other questions? Please submit them now. Um, John, is there any other comments from you that you would like to add to your presentation? Um, we've been like we've enjoyed it very much while we were like watching it here, um, and I made some notes, but you basically answered all my questions <laughs> in your presentation already. <laughs> so um, there's yeah, nothing I, left I, to. I, I do have a question, which is. Um... I'd be interested to find out when people think this is going to end. Yeah. So, um, yeah, let's ask this to the audience. If anyone um, wants to answer John's question, please feel free to submit that in the chat box. Um, yeah. Well, no one has the answer to that a hundred percent, unfortunately. Um, yeah. We, we, everyone is hoping that it kind of like, 
well, end, ending is not the right word, I guess, right? Um, it's more of a, when is it gonna relax a bit, if that's what you could say, probably. Yeah. Um, here's another question, John. In what ways do you suggest that villas are safer than hotels in the current scenario? Um, I, I think the, 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 the most obvious reason is that you're not mixing with many other people. Um, and, you know, I, I, I typically look at a, a family unit. Um, you know, you've got two parents, you've got two kids, let's say they're in two separate rooms. Um, you meet in the lobby, you know, you're, you're starting to sort of, the experience is very, 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 very different. Um, whereas if you're staying in a villa, you know, you're, you're in the same location. Um, and, and, and certainly with our villas, you'll have the same staff throughout the same, your, your period of stay. Um, so you, you're naturally self-isolating, but you're self-isolating with the group that you share your house with. Um, whereas in a hotel, you, you're sort of not in a natural self-isolating uh, environment. Um, and so then it's down to cleanliness of the properties and things like that. Um, so I think um, it, it, the, the, the biggest aspect is it, it's naturally self-isolating. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. I think that was very uh, clear and um, understandable. I have one. Oh, there's another one. <laughs> so I will keep mine. <laughs> um, do you think travel in Asia will take longer to recover culturally as it's being more cautious than maybe Western, um, Western travelers? Um, I find Asians are far more forgetful. Um, I am actually staggered how quick um, Asia gets back on the bicycle, if you were for an expression. So um, I, I actually think, no, I think the, 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 some of the Asian markets, maybe the Japanese are, are more timid and will take longer. Um, but no, I, I find that um, once there's that confidence, um, it comes back very, very quickly. So. Um, uh, I, in some ways, think that Asia might actually be first um, and see places like China um, being quite quick as well. So, um, no, I don't think, Ch I don't see Asia being timid at all. Okay. And you might have answered this during your presentation, so please excuse if I ask again, but what I'm interested in, um, did you see, so the borders are closed in a lot of the countries here in Asia, but what about the domestic travel since it has kind of slowly um, opened up again domestically? Do you also see a change in the bookings? Yeah, yeah I mean, it, it's quite interesting. If you look at all, I mean, if I look at all the bookings we've received today, uh, they'll be from Indonesia, people living in Indonesia, people living in Thailand, people living in Japan. Uh, there'll be a few for next year from other countries where people are now maybe increased in confidence, but relatively few. Mm -hmm. um, I think the biggest issue we face is that the opening up of domestic travel has been on and off sometimes, um, you know, particularly in someone like Indonesia. Um, and and so, um, so again, people need a little bit of certainty. Um, but no, I mean, if you look at the Indian, if you look at the villas in Goa, they're full of Indians from Mumbai because they don't want to be in Mumbai or Delhi um, mm. because of the risks, you know, they, 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 the high risks there. And they'd rather be in an isolated villa and, a, uh, and being looked after in that type of environment. So, so yes, we have seen a growth in there and, and, and you know, almost other countries have disappeared mm. um, until people are more confident they know when things are going to open up. Okay, thanks. Um, and then there's one more question, let me see. Okay, that's, I think that's also a nice closing question. It's more of a personal question. Where would you travel first once the borders open up again? <laughs> <laughs> Anyone who knows me well knows that I'm passionate about Sri Lanka. Oh, okay. Um, and so I would be on the first aeroplane out of here to Sri Lanka. Nice. <laughs> um, I think Sri Lanka has so much to offer the world. So yeah, my passion would be there. Thank you very much. That's a nice question. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for that question. It's really nice. And also your answer. I've, I haven't been to Sri Lanka myself, but I heard a lot of good things. So yes, hopefully I'm going to have the chance to go there in the future as well. Um, yeah, I think we will um, end this webinar here for today.
Thank you so much, um, John Stonham from Elite Heavens for presenting. This, as we said in the beginning, this recording will be available on YouTube, so you can rewatch it or share it with everyone um, after we shared it with you. And if you have any other questions, um, please feel free to reach out at membership at pada.org. Um, if you have questions to Elite Tavins or John Stoneham, please also feel free to send them to us. We, we are happy to forward everything. Um, and I think that's it. So thanks for joining us today. And I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. Um, and uh, we'll see you guys next time and have a nice morning, evening, good night, afternoon, wherever you're based. Okay, thanks John again. And thanks very much, everyone. Bye.